80 degrees in the shade. A man wearing a heavy army jacket, a pullover wool cap, and dark sunglasses walked into the first American bank at the corner of Maple and Main Streets in downtown Short Beach. The man walked up to the teller and held up a hand grenade for all to see. He said, give me all your money, all the money in this bank right now. Everyone in the lobby screamed and started running, even the security guard. Nervously, the young female teller handed the man three big bags loaded with cash. He walked out the door. A second later, one of the money bags exploded, covering him with red dye. He yelled in pain and surprise and started pacing around in circles because he couldn't see where he was going. He couldn't see, but he could hear. He heard the police siren get closer. Then he heard the police tell him to get down on his stomach on the sidewalk and put his hands behind his back. They handcuffed him and placed him in the back of the police car. Seeing the hand grenade on the sidewalk, the police told everyone to get back. They sealed off the whole block and called the bomb squad. The bomb squad came and examined the hand grenade. Then they laughed. They told the police it was a fake. The hand grenade was actually a harmless dummy, something a 12-year-old might play with. The police chuckled. The bank employees returned to work. The bank customers returned to their lines. The bank robber, hopefully, would never return. Thousands of immigrants who need to file papers related to immigration status, green cards, and resident cards no longer have to stand in line for hours on end. The immigration office now has a new system called Info Pass. Applicants simply schedule a time and a date to meet with an immigration officer using InfoPass. They don't even have to go to the immigration office. InfoPass is a website that they can access on their home computer or a library computer. To beat the crowds, immigrants in Los Angeles used to get in line the night before. They would start lining up outside the building at 6 p.m. and spend the night in the cold or occasionally in the rain. By the following morning, there might be 200 people in line. This, of course, was an unpleasant surprise to people who thought they were early birds by arriving at 7 a.m. Sometimes people would sell their place in line to others for $50 or more. Where there are lines, there are vendors. No one had to worry about going hungry in line because of the variety of hot and cold food and drinks being sold all night long. Occasionally, the police received reports about people being pickpocketed while waiting in the overnight lines, but such reports were rare. Many immigrants prefer not to get involved with police for fear of being sent back to their native country. With the new system, people with appointments are in and out of the building within an hour. Applicants show up 15 minutes before their appointment time. Things are so efficient now that about 120 applicants per hour can be processed through the immigration office. Before Info Pass, it was about 40 people an hour. Jimmy lives on the second floor of a six unit apartment building. His front door has two locks, a security deadbolt, and a regular door handle lock. The front door also has a peephole, a tiny piece of glass through which Jimmy can look out his door at about eye level to preview who is knocking on his door or ringing his doorbell. The peephole is a security device, but Jimmy never uses it. When someone knocks, he just opens the door. First of all, he lives in a safe neighborhood, so security is not really a problem. Second, people rarely knock on Jimmy's door, so he is always eager to greet a visitor. Before you can knock on the front door, you have to push the button on the black screen door to open the screen door. The screen door has an inside lock on it, but the lock has not worked since the screen door was installed more than two years ago. This has bothered Jimmy from day one. Today, Jimmy finally decided to do something about the lock on the screen door. It was a nice, warm, sunny day. Jimmy was in his shorts. No flip-flops, no shirt. 
The lock was part of the screen door push button handle. The outside and inside handles were held together with just two screws. Jimmy got a flathead screwdriver and loosened both screws. He kept adjusting the screws and pushing on the outside button. Eventually, he adjusted the screws enough to where the lever stayed in the locked position when he pushed on the outside button. Finally, he had made the right adjustment. But now he needed to put a spacer on the inside handle to maintain that adjustment. He found a piece of plastic that was just the right thickness. He inserted the plastic between the handle and the door frame itself, and then he tightened the two screws. Bingo! It worked perfectly. He could push on the outside button with all his might, and the lever would remain locked. Jimmy grinned. The screen door finally worked properly. Jimmy had fixed a two year old problem in less than an hour. He was ecstatic. He returned the screwdriver to the toolbox, thinking, I'm a genius. It had been another hot spring day. By 10 o'clock in the evening, it had only cooled down to 87 degrees, according to Larry's thermometer in the living room. He rarely looked at this thermometer because he usually didn't care what the exact temperature was. Larry had two table fans in his bedroom. Because of the high temperatures, the last three evenings had been two fan nights. He used his air conditioner only occasionally. During one month the previous summer, he had used the air conditioner 10 days consecutively, day and night. His electric bill that July, normally about $30, was $77. But Larry figured that once in a while using the AC wouldn't kill him. So that evening at 11.30, just before he went to bed, he turned on the AC. He set the thermostat to 72 degrees. He woke up four hours later when he heard a big bang, which sounded like two cars had run into each other on the street outside. But it wasn't two cars. It was the AC capacitor on the roof. It had just blown up. Larry's air conditioner was officially dead. Two circuit breakers had switched off, so he switched them back on. Larry had already suspected that there was something wrong with his air conditioner. He called Jack the repairman, but Jack didn't show up until four days later because he was so busy repairing all the other air conditioners in the neighborhood. When Jack finally came, he climbed up on the roof. Larry heard a lot of banging. 20 minutes later, Jack told Larry, you need a new air conditioner. Yours is the original model that came with this apartment building. All the other original AC units have been replaced. Yours lasted longest, but now it's kicked the bucket. I'm going to call your landlady to see if she will approve a new AC unit for you. It's going to cost $1,200 parts and labor. Wow, said Larry. Jack said that if everything went as planned, he'd install a new unit Monday morning. Until then, he said with a smile, stay cool. Larry said, no problem, but he wondered if he should drive to the thrift store to look for a third fan for his bedroom. A federal judge sentenced Bruce Jones to 12 years in federal prison for fraud. Over a 10-year period, Jones had managed to swindle almost $10 million from thousands of gullible people throughout the state. He advertised his fantastic ideas on TV. For some reason, Jones said, TV seems to break the ice. Even though you are a total stranger to the viewer, once he sees you on TV in his home, he feels like he knows you. You enter his living room and become a trusted friend. Jones had an imagination that wouldn't quit. One time he showed viewers an official government earthquake report, which proved that the western half of California would collapse into the sea within three years. For $100, he said, Jones would insure your house and property for full value. Thousands of people who saw that TV ad sent him $100 each. In another TV ad, Jones claimed that he had negotiated with the federal and state government for exclusive air rights. 
He told viewers that for only $100, they could own the first 10 miles above all their property. You would be able to charge any commercial plane that flew over your property $100 per crossing. You would also be able to charge government rockets, satellites, space shuttles, and space stations $100 for each and every violation of your air rights. Another time, Jones claimed to have invented a product that gets rid of calories. He showed the viewers a spray can of NoCal. He said that by simply spraying NoCal on your food, a chemical interaction would cause all the calories in the food to simply evaporate within about 10 seconds. The NoCal was only $10 a can. As usual, Jones received thousands of checks in the mail. The judge told Jones that he should be ashamed of himself. Jones responded that he was very ashamed of himself and that when he got out of prison, he hoped to become a TV consultant to help people avoid getting scammed. He told the judge that he was already developing an instructional CD that for merely $100 would save people thousands of dollars in scams. The judge nodded and then changed Jones's sentence from 10 years to 12 years. A 36-year-old man stormed into the Ramona post office, yelling at everyone to get out of his way. Carrying a shotgun, he climbed up onto the countertop and told everyone to lie on the floor. Then he pulled the trigger and fired a round into the ceiling. Plaster splattered onto the floor and the customers. The man ordered all the customers and employees to sit up and look at him. He said, repeat after me, I hate the post office. Everyone repeated the words. He fired another round, but this one he aimed at the front plate glass window. Shattered glass went everywhere. Three minutes later, five police cars pulled up in front of the post office. Lights flashing and sirens wailing. Using a bullhorn, a police officer told the man to walk out backwards with his hands up. The man fired another blast out the shattered window. The police officer and his bullhorn were uninjured. However, one police car had three little pit marks in it. The man yelled, I'm not coming out until the post office pays me for pain and suffering. A postal truck ran into my car two years ago. My back is killing me. I can't work anymore. My wife left me. I can't take it anymore. After a while, the man calmed down. He released all the people inside. At 7 p.m., the man walked out backwards with his hands up. The police handcuffed him, put him in the back seat of the car, and drove him to the police station. A post office official said that they had tried to settle with the man out of court, but he refused anything less than a million dollars. So the whole thing went to court. He said, I guess he got tired of waiting for the trial to begin. He'll probably go to jail for a few years because of this stunt. Two men chanced upon a trap door in a back room of a historic church near San Francisco. They discovered 23 religious murals painted by Native Americans more than 200 years ago. The murals record scenes from the Bible. Arthur Anderson, an artist, and Eric Bush, a painter, had been to the church many times before, but they were not aware of any trap doors in the building. The only reason they discovered it was that Arthur dropped a coin onto the floor while pulling a small knife out of his pants pocket. He heard the coin hit the floor and roll. He started searching. A minute later, he found his dime. Gotcha, he said proudly. But then he saw what looked like an unusual gap in the floorboard. With his knife, he began digging around the gap. The floorboard suddenly loosened. Arthur felt that he was onto something. He removed the floorboard and saw a rope handle attached to what looked like a trap door. Eric helped Arthur remove four more floorboards. Then Arthur slid open the trap door. Beneath it was a hole in the ground about 15 feet long 20 feet wide and two feet deep. They shined a flashlight into the hole and saw the murals. They were not wrapped, covered, or otherwise protected, yet they were in wonderful condition, according to Eric. 
God truly does work in mysterious ways, said Arthur. The murals use only the colors black, red, and yellow. The smallest are about 12 by 12 inches, and the biggest are about 24 by 24 inches. Digital photographs were taken of all the murals before they were loaded onto a truck. All 23 murals, created about 1791, are now at the Museum of Native American Art. They will be inspected, cleaned, archived, and examined by experts. They will not be put on public display until early next year. Museum officials expect a huge turnout when that day occurs. This is truly rare, said one official. I wonder how many more treasures are out there waiting for someone to drop a dime on them. The Oakville Pier collapsed Saturday afternoon at 3.30. Although hundreds of people were on the pier at the time of the collapse, no one was killed and only 15 people were injured. One person was seriously injured. That person was a 43-year-old man who suffered two broken legs, eight broken ribs, and a punctured lung. Hundreds of people gathered around to watch the rescue efforts. Three local television stations and two radio stations broadcast live from the pier. The collapse occurred after a big rig went out of control Saturday morning and slammed into one of the main supports for the pier. For public safety reasons, a city council member wanted to close the pier immediately. However, local businesses on the pier and nearby protested. Oakville officials decided to wait until tomorrow before sending out a structural engineer to investigate the damage. The driver reeked of booze, said a police officer, who had written the truck driver a ticket for driving under the influence. He was so drunk that he didn't even apply his brakes before he crashed into the support. It's a miracle that he didn't kill someone, said the officer, who took the driver to jail. City officials said it was too early to get a complete damage estimate, but that repairs to the pier would probably cost at least $500,000 and take a month or more. The local business people are very unhappy because the repair process will significantly reduce consumer purchases for the summer season. We make 80% of our annual profits from June through September, noted one t-shirt vendor. This is going to hurt. The Rockford police chief and some city officials want to install video cameras in all 100 police cars. They think this will reduce the number of lawsuits filed against the city. In the last five years, Rockford has paid out more than $5 million to settle about 40 lawsuits. The chief said if cameras had been in those cars, we wouldn't have had to pay one dime. We are always pulling over drunks or drug users who try to fight the cops or shoot them. Then they always claim that the police started beating them first or started shooting at them first. What hogwash. The cost of installing cameras will be about $500 per vehicle. The city council will vote on the proposal next Monday. 10 of the 13 council members, when asked about the proposal, said that they liked the idea. One member said that it makes good fiscal sense and common sense. If the cameras are approved, they can be installed in all the cars within six weeks. The police officers enthusiastically support camera use. One officer said that too many people think the police are liars. Cameras would show citizens that police tell the truth. The money that we've been spending on lawsuits will be better spent on more cameras, said one officer. Citizen reaction to the idea of police car cameras is mixed. One person said that the police should have started doing this years ago when video cameras were invented. But an elderly man said that cameras were an invasion of privacy. These police are trying to stick their nose into everything, he said. He was going to attend the council meeting to condemn the proposal. He hoped that other citizens would join him. A straight-A student got a C in cooking class and didn't like it. She didn't like it so much that her dad filed a complaint in federal court about it. He alleges that the teacher, who is white, discriminated against his daughter, who is black. He seeks to have her grade changed from a C to an A and asks for unspecified financial damages. Virginia Brown is in the ninth grade at Ashley High School. 
Since her first year in school, she has had perfect attendance and all her grades have been A's. Virginia's father said her heart was broken when she got the C. She cried the whole weekend, he said. She wouldn't come out of her room. Her eyes were red and puffy. My little girl hasn't been this upset since her cat got run over by a car when she was six years old. Virginia is a model student. She's the class president. She's on the swim team, the volleyball team, and the track team. She belongs to the chess club. She is a member of the Girl Scouts and sings in her church choir. The home economics teacher is 28-year-old Jessica Smith. This is her first year teaching. Ms. Smith said that discrimination was absolutely not the issue. Some of my best friends are African Americans, she said. This isn't a black and white problem. Everybody in America wants to sue everybody else. I'm going to sue them for defamation of character and whatever else my lawyer comes up with. The school principal, who grew up in India, said that he supported Ms. Smith 100%. He said that Virginia is an excellent student who would have no problem getting into the best universities, even with a C in cooking. She won't have any difficulty finding a great university, but she might have problems finding a husband, he laughed. She'd better look for a man who likes to eat out a lot. About 2 p.m. Monday, a California Highway Patrol officer was hit by an SUV. The officer was thrown about 10 feet before landing in a hedge. The officer was assisting a motorist whose car had stalled on the freeway. The police officer was listed in stable condition at a nearby hospital. The accident occurred after the fast-moving white SUV drove onto the shoulder where the two cars were parked. The SUV struck the officer before plowing into the police car. The driver of the stalled car was unhurt. The SUV rolled completely over. The driver climbed out of the SUV and took off running in the direction of a nearby off-ramp. Because another police vehicle was nearby, the police caught the driver quickly. He was charged with drunk driving, property damage, causing personal injury, and leaving the scene of an accident. The driver had no license and no insurance. He had been convicted a year ago of driving while intoxicated. At that time, he had also injured someone and also fled the scene. He was sentenced to jail for six months, but because the jail was so overcrowded, he was released in one month. What can we do, said a policeman. There are a lot more drunk drivers out there every night than there are police. The only time we can get them off the streets for good is when they kill someone. Hunter Smith, five, drowned in a swimming pool after apparently wandering away from two teenagers, one of whom was his babysitter. Paramedics and hospital staff members spent several hours trying to revive Hunter. Police pulled the unconscious boy from the cold water of the neighbor's pool about 3.20 p.m. Wednesday. The babysitter was 16. The other teen was her boyfriend, 17. The boy's parents had no comment about their son's unfortunate death. Police questioned both teens separately as to how the accident occurred. Their stories did not match. The girl said Hunter disappeared while she was using the bathroom. The boy said Hunter disappeared while he was using the bathroom. After further questioning and some searching around the house, the police determined that the boy disappeared while both the teens were using the bedroom. They had actually put him in the bedroom closet, but were so busy with each other that they never saw or heard the boy leave the closet and the house, an officer said. Charges might be filed against the teens for involuntary manslaughter and against the neighbor for leaving the gate to the pool unlocked. An 80-year-old woman died Tuesday afternoon in a fire. The blaze was reported about 2.30 p.m. at a home on Sunnyside Avenue. The victim was identified as Mary Cass. Her husband, Roy Cass, 80, was not at home at the time of the fire. Investigators from the local fire department were trying to determine the exact cause of the fire. 
They said it looked like the woman had fallen asleep on the sofa with a cigarette in her hand. The value of the home was estimated at $700,000. The Casses were married in 1945. Both of them had been smokers throughout most of their lives. Mr. Cass said, Six months ago we decided to quit smoking because we wanted to live to be 100. So we went to a smoking cessation clinic. The clinic worked. We both managed to quit a month ago. At least I thought we both did. I can't believe she was smoking behind my back. Mr. Cass started sobbing after his remarks. He repeatedly cried out his wife's name. Authorities took him to a nursing home where he could be kept under surveillance. We've had too many instances of long-time married couples who, if they discover their spouse is dead, commit suicide within 48 hours, said a nursing home spokesperson. Mr. Cass's behavior has been erratic, from talking nonstop to crying to staring vacantly. We are going to have to watch him closely. A small plane crashed into a house Sunday afternoon, killing the pilot and destroying half of the home. The family inside the house escaped without injury. The single-engine airplane crashed about 5.30 p.m. The pilot, the only one in the plane, was trying to make an emergency landing at the airport. The pilot's body was found on the bed in the master bedroom. The plane crashed into one end of the house, where the three bedrooms were. That part of the house was wrecked. The Carrolls, who owned the house, were all at home eating dinner. Oh my gosh, said Mrs. Carroll. I thought the world had come to an end. I never heard such a loud sound. We all ducked under the table thinking it was another earthquake. When nothing else happened, we got brave and decided to investigate. They immediately called 911 when they discovered the cause of the thunderous sound. The family was lucky because there was no fire. Authorities suspect that a lack of fuel contributed to the crash. Mr. Carroll said that they might have to move out until they can get the house repaired. The police will release the pilot's name after they have notified his next of kin. Wednesday night, Howard asked Glenn if he wanted to go fishing and girl watching that weekend at Santa Fe Lake. We'll leave Friday morning and return late Sunday night, he said. Glenn said he had to clean out his garage, so Howard went by himself. Howard had also planned to lie around the hotel pool, soak up the sun, read a good book, and look at pretty women in their bathing suits. His own apartment didn't have a pool. So whenever he traveled, he always liked to stay at a place with a pool. But when he arrived at the hotel about noon, he saw that there were no pretty girls at the pool. There were no girls at all. There was nobody at the pool because the pool was empty. It was being repaired all that week. The staff had forgotten to tell Howard this little detail. Howard called Glenn late Friday night. How was the fishing? Glenn asked. Didn't see any, didn't catch any, replied Howard. Well, did you catch any women? No, and don't even ask me how many beauties I saw at the pool. I didn't go to any bars, but I did go to a Mongolian all-you-can-eat place and had a good dinner. I think one of the waitresses liked me. She asked me if I wanted extra ketchup. Well, I hope you said yes. Anytime a woman asks you if you want extra anything, that's female code. It means they like you. I said no. There was a whole bottle right in front of me. Well, you blew it. I don't know when you're going to learn to pick up on those signals. Next time, I'll go with you and show you all the tricks. If you knew all the tricks, you wouldn't be divorced three times. A woman decorating her Christmas tree Monday was shot in her left arm when a bullet went through her living room window. Police said the incident occurred about 5 p.m. A 22 caliber shell casing was found across the street from the victim's home. Police did not find a weapon in the vicinity. Mrs. Wilma Johnson was treated at a local hospital and allowed to go home. A hospital spokesman said she should recover nicely. She is in her late 50s 
divorced, and living with Bob, the older of her two adult sons. Bob wasn't home at the time of the shooting. Police will patrol the area more frequently as a result of this shooting. They don't know if the shooting was intentional or accidental. They are asking the public to help if they know anything. They interviewed the neighbors. One neighbor said he heard a gunshot, but in this neighborhood, he said, he was used to hearing gunshots. The police also questioned Mrs. Johnson's ex-husband, Joe, who lives three blocks away. Joe said if he was going to shoot at his ex-wife, he'd make sure he shot her in her butt. That's a target you could hit from a mile away, he laughed. Despite such remarks, the police spokesperson said Joe is not a suspect at this time. Bob Evans died about 1.30 a.m. after a woman stabbed him in the back outside Lover's Lounge. Police who arrived at the club found Evans lying in the parking lot with a bloody ice pick on the pavement next to him. A sobbing woman was cradling the victim's head in her lap and stroking his hair. Police identified the woman as Sarah Haynes, 39, an emergency room nurse. They took her into custody and said she would be booked for murder. She was Evan's longtime girlfriend. The lounge's bartender said Haynes started arguing with Evans when she saw him dancing with a young woman. I thought there might be trouble when I saw her walk in, said the bartender. She was looking all around with a wild look in her eyes. He was on the floor dancing away with this young blonde. She went straight at them. She pulled the blonde out of his arms and started yelling at him. Evans then led Sarah outside, apparently to avoid a scene inside the club. A witness who was sitting in his car told police he saw them argue for a couple of minutes. When Evans turned around to walk back inside, Sarah pulled the ice pick out of her purse and stabbed Evans several times. He collapsed to the ground. Then she sat down, put his head in her lap, and started crying. A 70-foot fishing boat, the Shark Catcher, sank five miles from shore today in the Pacific at about 4.30 p.m. The boat was returning from a successful one-day trip. There were 17 anglers aboard and four crew members. There were also about 100 freshly caught tuna, salmon, and mackerel aboard. Some of them may have also survived the sinking. Luckily, the shark catcher started sinking when it was only a quarter mile from another fishing boat, the tuna taker, which was also returning from a day trip. The two captains, Mo and Curly, had been talking to each other over the radio while headed back to their landing in Santa Barbara. They were comparing notes, who had caught what, how much, and where. During their conversation, Mo heard what sounded like an explosion. He told Curly to hold on a minute. Mo's crew discovered a hole in the hole that was too big for plugs or pumps. Mo told Curly he needed his help. Mo then told all the passengers to don their life jackets and abandon the boat. This is the second boat that I've lost, said Mo. The good thing, of course, is that I've never lost any paying customers. Curly, captain of the rescue boat, said, We were lucky that it was a clear, calm day. We pulled a lot of people out of the water, but it went very smoothly. I think the Coast Guard will be proud of us. Oh no, Denzel thought. Where'd that come from? He was looking at a big red dry stain that was on the carport where he always parked his car. There was only one thing to do. Check his power steering fluid and his transmission fluid, both of which are red. The power steering fluid was at the proper level, so that left the transmission fluid. A small leak could result in a damaged transmission, which could cost $1,000 to $2,000 to repair or replace. Denzel did not have $1,000 or $2,000. Denzel was not sure about how to check his transmission fluid level, but he found the instructions in his car manual. They were not complicated. He ran his engine for about 15 minutes to get it up to normal operating temperature. Next, he shifted the transmission through all the gears, 
and then let the car idle for three minutes in park. Then he pulled out the dipstick. The fluid was at the correct level. Denzel breathed a sigh of relief. As he drove off in his car, he wondered if he would ever find out the cause of that stain. Or would it be one of those mysteries of life, like the mystery of why his last girlfriend had left him? Why did you break up with me? He had asked her on the phone a while ago. I thought everything was going well between us. Then wham, out of nowhere, you told me we were through. You needed more space, you said. What does that mean? It's a long story, she replied. Go ahead, he said. I've got plenty of time. I've got to go, she said. Women, Denzel muttered as the phone went dead. A 39-year-old woman admitted that she had lied. She claimed that she bought the latest winning lottery ticket in Massachusetts, but then lost it. The ticket was worth $18 million after all deductions. Jean Fenn was charged with grand larceny. A conviction could put her in prison for up to seven years. The real winner of the ticket, Kevin Hayes, 66, presented it a week ago to the liquor store where he had bought it. That store will receive 1% of the prize, or $180,000. The owner of the store, Mark Abrams, 56, was overjoyed. Last year, we had a storm that blew half of our roof off. It cost $25,000 to put a new roof on. Hayes said that he was reminded to check his numbers when he heard that a woman had lost her winning ticket. He and his wife had been camping in the mountains when the winning number was drawn. But I feel sorry for this woman, said Haynes. She only did this out of desperation. In fact, I'm going to help her out financially after she gets out of prison. It's a shame that this wealthy country has so many poor people. So I'm going to donate a lot of this money to different charities. What do I need $18 million for? The checks to Hayes and Abrams should arrive within two weeks, according to a lottery spokesman. The spokesman mentioned that lottery players should remember that the odds of winning the lottery are only about 1 in 40 million. Even so, most people think that someone has to win, and it might as well be them. A basketball game ended abruptly Saturday afternoon when 18-year-old Damon Miller was fatally shot at a recreation center. The gunman, who called himself Ace, ran south on Oak Street after the shooting and remains at large. Miller was pronounced dead at the scene by the paramedics. He died from two gunshot wounds to his chest. The paramedics did not arrive immediately because they were tied up at a four-car crash a mile away. This was the second such shooting during a basketball game apparently by the same gunman. According to witnesses, Miller did a little dance after making a game-winning three-point basket. When Ace told him to stop celebrating, Miller ignored him. Then Ace pulled a small gun out of his baggy shorts and fired two quick shots. Everyone else backed away. Instead of running immediately, Ace picked up the basket and made a three-pointer himself. Then he did a little dance next to the victim's head and fled. A police officer said the suspect will be charged with a lot more than unsportsmanlike conduct when arrested. Eyewitnesses said Ace is a white male, 5 foot 11 inches, about 200 pounds, with a small scar on his left cheek. Local activists criticized the police for dragging their feet in their search for the suspect. You can bet if it was two white men who had been shot by a black man There'd be a policeman on every basketball court in town till he was caught, said one activist. The federal government, displaying even less sense than usual, has yielded to the French fry industry. Frozen French fries, sliced, fried in oil, and then packaged, are now approved as fresh vegetables by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The French fry industry has been petitioning the USDA for years to get this approval. They say that their product is similar to cucumbers that have a wax coating. They argue that they use 100% vegetable oil, which is much healthier for consumers than plain wax. 
Most consumers, of course, beg to differ. You must be joking, said Annie, 50. How can you consider a product that's deep fried in oil to be a fresh vegetable? Even if I steamed broccoli, I could no longer call it fresh broccoli. It's cooked. I wish I were a lobbyist so my congressman would help me. Unfortunately, I'm only a tax-paying citizen. The USDA defends its decision, saying that potatoes undeniably are vegetables. Although french fries are fried in oil, they are still potatoes. If you let them sit on your countertop for a couple of weeks, a USDA spokesman said, the fries will rot just like all other fresh vegetables. Consumer advocates say the USDA has totally lost touch with the consumers. They'd probably declare that eggshells are nutritious if a lobbyist asked them to, said one advocate. Mark was cursing the driver in front of him because she was creeping along. He was running late for a golf game with his friend Barney. He was on a two-lane road that led to the golf course. The road was straight uphill. It went for six blocks through a busy residential neighborhood. There was a four-way stop sign at the end of each block. Every time the woman ahead arrived at a stop sign, she looked left and right. Then she looked left and right again. Then she proceeded slowly forward. Mark was pulling his hair out. Never be in a hurry in L.A., he muttered to himself. Mark didn't pass her because there was too much oncoming traffic. At the very last stop sign, she turned right. At last, no one was in front of him. Mark put the pedal to the metal to make up for lost time. However, as soon as he rounded the first curve, he had to immediately brake for a cement truck crawling up the hill at about five miles per hour. Mark couldn't believe it. His tea time was 11.45, and it was 11.39. Mark ignored the solid yellow line and passed the truck. It was 11.40 when he got to the parking lot. He walked quickly to the clubhouse to tell Mel, the assistant pro, that he had arrived. Mel said, we're running about 10 minutes behind, so you're okay. But Barney just called. He said there was a fatal accident on the freeway. The highway patrol closed his side of the freeway. He said to go on without him. He's going back home. Grady was rich, but he was 78 and on his deathbed. No amount of money or love could save him now. In his youth, Grady had been a major skirt chaser. No woman was safe from his charm. He used to juggle three or four girlfriends at a time. He'd often accidentally call them by the wrong names. The first time that happened to a new girlfriend, she would get upset. Instead of lying, Grady would admit that he had another girlfriend, or two. But, he would quickly add, you are my number one. You'll always be my number one. Somehow this little white lie often worked. Sometimes his various girlfriends would even end up meeting each other and become fast friends. Any attractive woman was a target for Grady. He would walk right up to her and say, you're very attractive. Are you single and unattached? If she said yes, he'd invite her out for a cup of coffee right then and there. If she said yes, but she didn't have time just then for coffee, he'd get her phone number and ask for a rain check. If she said no, he'd ask her if she had a twin sister who was single and unattached. This often made the woman smile or laugh. Sometimes she would change her no to a yes. Grady was a wonderful dancer. He was just average looking, but he carried himself with confidence and had a ready smile and a pleasant laugh. He was well read, he knew a thousand jokes, and he had no bad habits. Perhaps most important, he made a woman feel like a woman, according to many of his girlfriends. Even in his old age, Grady hadn't slowed down. Tending to his dying needs were Dee Dee and Mimi, a pair of 40-year-old twins that Grady had finally settled down with. The mailman delivers good news and bad news. Topping the bad news list for many people who live in Los Angeles is a jury summons. This document tells you that you must respond by mail or phone 
For possible service on a jury, many people feel that jury duty is a boring chore and would prefer not doing it. In fact, court clerks say that the most common question they hear is, why do I have to serve? The official response is, jury duty is a responsibility that all qualified citizens must share. If you are a citizen, if you can read and understand English, if you are over 18 years old and if you're not a felon, you are eligible for jury duty. If you ignore the summons, you might be fined up to $1,500. A jury trial might last one day or one month. If you work for the government, this is no problem because the government will pay you your regular salary while you are on jury duty. However, if you are self-employed, you lose your regular income for that time period. Instead of your regular income, you get $15 a day for sitting on a jury. This is another reason people try to avoid jury duty. Jack got the bad news yesterday. Even though he was retired and sat around all day watching reruns of old movies, he told his wife Polly he wasn't going to be a juror. He hated jury duty, and he was not going to let the courts interfere with his retirement. So, how do you think you are going to get out of it? Polly asked, both amused and irritated. Are you going to claim that you're dead, or are you going to tell them you've moved out of the country? No, both of those involve too much paperwork. I've got a better idea. It's a medical excuse. It says here that if you have a physical disability, you can be dismissed. What's your disability? Your bad back doesn't allow you to sit in a chair watching reruns all day? No, something better than that. I've got gas. It'll offend the other jurors and everyone else in the courtroom. They'll have to open up all the windows or issue gas masks. But there's one problem. You don't have gas. But I know how to create it. I'll eat a lot of peanuts and fruit in the morning that I go to court. As soon as they get a whiff of my problem, they'll tell me to go home and stay home. That's a brilliant idea, Polly said as she rolled her eyes. At least it would get him out of the house for one day, she thought. Lena often asked Luke to dinner. Lena loved Luke, but Luke loved Lena's cooking, not Lena herself. Lena accepted that for the time being, but she felt that with enough meals and enough time, she would get her man. Luke rarely stayed more than 10 minutes past the last bite of dessert. Lena would ask Luke if he wanted to watch TV or play cards or chess or take a walk around the neighborhood, but Luke always declined. He always said, I've got to go. They both knew that Luke didn't have to go anywhere. All he ever did was go back to his apartment and read books or go online. Tonight was probably going to be more of the same, but Lena was a patient woman. She loved to cook and she loved to watch people eat her cooking. Tonight she prepared shrimp, fresh green beans, mashed potatoes, and asparagus. Luke ate everything with gusto. Then she brought out her homemade cheesecake with vanilla ice cream for dessert. Luke asked, are you trying to fatten me up for something? Every time I come over here, I have to eat celery and lettuce for a week to get back down to my normal weight. Oh, stop exaggerating, Lena replied. You enjoy every mouthful. You're right, I apologize. I love your cooking, and if you didn't invite me over here, I'd be hurt and hungry. Lena watched contentedly as Luke devoured the cheesecake and ice cream. Someday, she thought, I will be his dessert. Julia was 12 years old. Her best friend Betsy was 13. Summer was almost over. School was about to start. Julia and Betsy were having lunch at Burger Boy. Betsy had decided that Julia needed a boyfriend. But why? asked Julia. I'm okay without one. What good is a 12 year old boy anyway? All they're interested in is playing baseball or riding their skateboards. Where does a girl fit into that picture? Don't be silly, replied Betsy, and forget about 12 year olds. They're immature. You should go for someone more experienced, 
someone at least 13 years old, someone who will carry your books and walk you to your classes, you need someone who will give you a Valentine's Day card and remember your birthday, you need someone to comfort you when you're sad and lonely, you need someone to protect you. But my dad does that, that's what dads are for. He comforts me, he protects me, and he remembers my birthday too. I've got a backpack to carry my books, and I know where all my classes are. I don't need an escort, and a Valentine's Day card means that someone loves you. What if I don't love them back? I don't want a Valentine's Day card from someone I don't love. I don't love anyone anyway. I'm too young. I don't think I even know what love is. Besides, you don't have a boyfriend. Why should I? Because you're my first client. I've decided that I'm going to be a matchmaker when I grow up. Well, if I'm your first client, that means I'll probably also be your first mistake. No thank you. Dave needed to pack for Saturday's fishing trip. He went into his hall closet where he had more than 20 rods and reels. Nowadays he went fishing twice a year at Big Bear, a huge lake in Southern California, about 7,000 feet up in the mountains. California tries to boost the fishing industry by sponsoring a free fishing day twice a year, once in June and once in September. That sufficed for Dave. He went mostly because it was a social event with a few friends, not so much to catch fish. Even by itself, the scenic drive up a twisty two-lane road was worth the trip. Not to mention the big, beautiful houses and trees that lined the shore of the lake. Packing was a project in itself. Dave had even created a computer file named Fishing Trip. It was a checklist of 45 things to take to Big Bear. He took two rods because on free fishing day you were allowed to fish with two rods instead of the usual one rod. He took a hooded sweatshirt, jeans, two pair of socks, a heavy hooded denim jacket, winter gloves, and a scarf. He also took flip-flops, shorts, a t-shirt, number 30 sunblock, sunglasses, a big hat, and a lightweight raincoat. If you go to Big Bear in June, you'd better be prepared for hot or cold, rain or shine. He packed a couple of magazines to read, just in case the fish weren't biting. He and his friends joked that the fish were always biting, in the spot you just left or the spot you were headed to. After about an hour and a half, Dave had gathered all the items on his list into a neat pile next to his door. He went to bed knowing that tomorrow's weather and fishing were unpredictable, but the good time with his friends was a given. A Continental Pacific Railroad freight train derailed on Tuesday about 40 miles north of Sacramento. The exact cause is still being investigated, but authorities say it was no accident. The head engineer said everything was fine, then suddenly everything wasn't. Of the freight train's 86 cars, 22 went off the tracks. Unfortunately, this incident did not involve any fatalities, human or otherwise. The head engineer was treated for a broken wrist at a nearby hospital. He was the only casualty. Trains throughout California frequently carry dangerous cargoes, such as chemicals. When these trains derail, authorities immediately evacuate nearby communities because of the danger of explosions or of harmful fumes. However, this train carried only lumber, new automobiles, and cattle destined for slaughter. After the mishap, lumber was scattered on either side of the tracks. About 20 automobiles were damaged. The biggest problem, however, was the cattle. About 300 of them were standing on or near the tracks, wandering into the nearby woods or standing on the nearby highway. Traffic on the two-lane highway was backed up for almost a mile in each direction. We know who did this said a California Highway Patrol spokesman. The train was sabotaged by a group called Tofu for You. They left their pamphlets all over the crime scene. They liberate animals that are on their way to the slaughterhouse. 
They think Americans should eat tofu instead of meat. They're wasting their time. All these cows are going to be burgers by tomorrow night. A classical guitarist was thrilled to hear from New York City police that his valuable guitar had been found. It disappeared almost a year ago when he got out of a taxi cab and forgot to take the guitar with him. Lawrence Lennon, 44, said he was running late that day. He was talking to his manager on his cell phone when he dashed out of the cab. He said that he gave the driver $60 and told him to keep the change. He walked through the front doors of the concert hall, still talking on the phone to his manager. Upon discovering his loss, Lennon used his cell phone to call the police. The policewoman asked him for the name of the cab company, the number of the cab, and the name of the driver. He said that she had to be kidding. She told Lennon that he could file a missing items report at the police station or online. Lennon asked for the online address. It was www.nypd.gov slash to protect and to serve slash have a nice day. She told him that finding the guitar might take a couple of years. Finding guitars was not as important as finding murderers and marijuana smokers. Then she told him to have a nice day. This year has been depressing, said Lennon. I had to postpone the recording of two new CDs. I've been using borrowed guitars, and I was losing hope of ever recovering my guitar. Lennon was reunited with his $1,000 guitar yesterday. The case and the guitar had been discovered in the corner of a coffee house only two blocks from where Lennon had lost it in the first place. Lennon had offered a $10,000 reward for its return. He said he would give the reward to the coffee house owner, who had notified the police. The police department prepared a news release about its success in tracking down the guitar. Lois Castle, 58, committed suicide at home with a revolver yesterday. Two police officers heard a single gunshot as they were about to knock on her front door. They were at her house to arrest her for the 1970 murder of her young stepdaughter. Castle apparently realized that she was going to be arrested. Only a month earlier, she had been interviewed by detectives about Dorothy's death 35 years ago. In 1970, Castle told police that the girl had fallen out of a tree she was climbing and hit her head on a rock. But Dorothy's natural father, Duane, who was married to Castle at the time, thought his wife was lying. She said she would hurt me if I bother her again, Dorothy had told her father earlier. Your little girl is making up stories about me. I try to love her, but she rejects me, Castle told Duane. An autopsy was inconclusive, and the death was ruled accidental. Duane divorced Castle shortly thereafter. But the case was reopened recently when a playmate of Dorothy's came forward. Beverly Lizenby, also seven at that time, said she was about to knock on the door of Dorothy's house that fatal day. But instead of knocking, she listened quietly as she heard Dorothy screaming for help and Castle telling her to shut up. Beverly listened until it was silent inside, then ran back home. She was so shaken by the event that she had told no one in all these years. The coroner dug up Dorothy's body and did a second autopsy. Using new crime-solving tools, he determined that Dorothy had been struck in the skull several times by a rock the size of a baseball. The police are now trying to locate Duane to tell him the good news. The annual teachers meeting was the only time that all the teachers got together in one place at one time. It was a three hour meeting from 7 to 10 p.m. Lecturers talked on various subjects. Each talk was followed by a question and answer period. It was an informal, pleasant evening. The evening always began with a delicious dinner catered by a local restaurant. This year's host was a Middle Eastern restaurant. Teachers piled as much as they wanted on their paper plates and found a seat outdoors or in the auditorium. Most teachers really seemed to appreciate the food. 
For Shane, this evening was his opportunity to check out the female teachers. This year, a beauty walked into the auditorium about 10 minutes late. She sat in the row in front of Shane, just two seats away. Shane couldn't believe it. She was not only the best looking woman in the auditorium, but she smiled at him before she sat down. She was tall and had long red hair. She was wearing a sexy black cocktail dress. Shane could not focus on the meeting anymore. He looked at the lecturers less than he looked at the redhead. He was enveloped in her perfume. She took notes right-handed. She ran her fingers through her hair. She crossed and uncrossed her legs. Shane was going crazy. Plus, there was no ring on her left hand. The meeting ended. The dean thanked everyone for attending. Everybody applauded the presenters. The redhead stood up. Shane stood up. She smiled at him and then walked out. Shane walked out. She went to the restroom. Shane waited. When she came out, he walked up to her. Hi, he smiled. My name's Shane. I was wondering if you have time for a cup of coffee. I was hoping we could share some of our teaching experiences. She smiled. Why, thank you. That's sweet of you. I appreciate your offer, but I've got to get home. My husband is babysitting tonight, and I'm sure he's pretty tired. Maybe another time? She smiled and walked away. A 29-year-old woman was driving her car in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was fatally wounded by a couple of stray bullets. The bullets were intended for a 20-year-old man who was seriously wounded by two other bullets. The shootings occurred an hour before sunset, a mile west of downtown Los Angeles. Two gang members attempted to rob the 20-year-old man. The victim punched one of his attackers, knocking him down, and then took off running. As he ran, the gangsters fired several times and struck him in the back. They also put a couple of errant shots into the head of the woman driver. Mortally wounded, she crashed through the big glass window of a salon, coming to a stop at the hair washing sinks. Fortunately, the salon was closed because its owner was at a family funeral. His nephew had been stabbed to death by a gang member a week earlier. The gang member who was robbing the nephew got angry when all he found in the nephew's wallet was a dollar, an ID card, and a library card. A library card? The gang member said angrily. You think you're smarter than me? If you're so smart, why are you getting robbed? He then stabbed the victim multiple times, ripped up the library card, spit on it, and ran away. This city's getting ridiculous, said a local neighborhood watch member. Criminals are killing people almost every day. They laugh at us. They know that, even if convicted, they will get free housing, free meals, and free medical care. And they get to sit around in jail all day reading magazines. That's punishment? It sounds more like a reward. What do the rest of us get for being honest? We get to work hard all day so we can die tired and poor. Police in San Dimas pulled over a florist van yesterday and arrested the driver, Carl Rover, for smoking and transporting marijuana. The police got suspicious when Carl remained stopped even after the light had turned green. One officer asked Carl where he was headed. Grinning broadly, Carl said he was making a delivery. The officer told Carl to turn off the radio which was blasting rock music. Dude, this is the Grateful Dead, Carl groaned. A moment later, Carl's cell phone rang. Carl said, hey dude, what's up? The officer grabbed the phone from Carl. Did you get the cash for the weed? Asked the voice on the other end. Yes, the officer replied, pretending that he was Carl. How much did you get? $1,000. $1,000? $1,000? What is the matter with you? That's $50,000 worth of grass. You idiot. I'm going to kill you. The officer laughed when the other person hung up. He went around to the back of the van and opened the doors. Although there were flowers in the back, there were also many plastic bags 
each about 12 inches square, packed tightly with marijuana. In the cab of the van, a joint was smoldering in the ashtray. The officer took it out of the ashtray and held it up to Carl. What do you know about this? He asked Carl. Grinning, Carl said, What do I know about it? I know everything about it. I planted it, I watered it, I harvested it, and I rolled it. It's dynamite weed, dude. Try it. The officer brought out his handcuffs. Carl's grin disappeared. Hey, at least let me have one more hit. Three months had passed. It was time for Tony to visit his dental hygienist again. The visit usually lasted two to three hours. The hygienist always went through a list of questions about his health. Then she took his pulse and blood pressure. Last, she ran her gloved finger all around the inside of his mouth, looking for and feeling for abnormalities. On this visit, she found one. It was a white spot on the side of his tongue. We often see this in smokers' mouths, she told him. She called the dentist over. How long has that been there? He asked Tony. I have no idea, said Tony. We're going to have to do a biopsy, the dentist said. It won't require more than two or three stitches. We have to make sure this spot is benign. We'll do it right after your teeth are cleaned. Tony couldn't eat anything except soup for a couple of days after the surgery, nor could he pronounce words clearly. If the white spot were malignant, how much more surgery would be required? How much of his tongue would be removed? He regretted all those years of smoking. A week later, the dentist removed the stitches and told Tony that the white spot was benign. Tony was relieved. A few days afterward, Tony was talking to a friend of his who was a longtime smoker. You really ought to quit, he suggested. That was a good scare I just got from my dentist. Getting part of your tongue cut out is not a pleasant thought. I'm not worried. You've got to die of something. I've got a greater chance of getting killed by a drunk driving a white SUV than by some white spot on my tongue. Besides, this is my only vice. I need to be able to enjoy something in life, don't I? But I love you so much, she said. I think I must be crazy. I can't stop thinking about you. I want to be with you all the time. I want to marry you. Maybe you are a little crazy, he said. Although I think that's part of being in love, but you hardly know me. I like you, but I'm not in love with you. I don't think I could ever be in love with you. Why not? I don't know, he lied. You're not my type. I'm not your type, she repeated. What is your type? A woman with no wrinkles and a perfect body? A woman who is beautiful even when she wakes up? A movie star? Is that your type? No, of course not. He lied again. I don't know. I'm like everybody else. You're either attracted to a certain person or you're not. So you're not attracted to me? Well, I didn't say that. He lied a third time. I'm making a fool of myself. You might even be laughing at me. You don't love me? You just said that you never could love me? No, I said I could never be in love with you, he said. Love? In love? What difference does it make anymore? I apologize. It was nice of you to put up with me. Please forgive me for making a fool of myself and for bothering you. I will never call you again. I must try to forget you now. I am dropping out of school tomorrow. I can't go there without thinking of you. My heart is so sad. She hung up. Alan walked outside. What was he supposed to do? He liked her, but he certainly didn't love her. Lead her on with lies or tell her the truth now? There was a beautiful full moon, but he felt sad. He knew that Natalie was probably crying right now. She must be so lonely. Veronica was an only child. Even as a child, she decided that she was going to be a doctor. All her dolls became her patients. Our dollhouses became hospitals for her patients. She spent her early childhood treating her patients for all kinds of diseases and injuries. She saved all of them and billed none of them. Veronica got straight A's in high school and college. Because she knew that good grades would help her get into a good medical school, she graduated from medical school near the top of her class. She became a pediatrician. She got married and had two kids, one boy and one girl. 
Veronica's husband, David, was an architect and a great cook. Her children did their homework without being told. They got straight A's in school. They ate all their vegetables without complaining. They were perfect little children, except for one thing. They argued with each other constantly. Veronica got home at 4.30 p.m. today. David gave her a big kiss and a hug. Then her kids gave her a kiss and a hug. She went upstairs and changed into shorts and a t-shirt. When she returned, the kids were waiting for her in the living room to talk about their day in school. Marvin, 10, said that today his biology teacher helped them cut up a dead frogs. They smelled bad, but he enjoyed seeing their little body parts, like their lungs and heart. I like biology, Marvin said. I want to be a biologist, an animal doctor, and an inventor when I grow up. I'm going to invent a pill so that animals all learn to live together without eating each other all the time. You're crazy, exclaimed Rebecca. What are the animals going to eat if they don't eat each other? You don't know anything. You're a girl and you're only nine, taunted Marvin. Marvin, be polite to your sister, Veronica admonished. Yes, ma'am, he said. I apologize, dear little sister. That didn't sound very sincere, Mommy, Rebecca complained. Okay, here's how I'll keep the animals from eating each other. I already thought of that, of course. The solution is a pill that will make all animals like to eat grass, like the cows and sheep do. That way no more animals will eat each other, and kids won't have to mow the lawn anymore. So that will kill two birds with one stone. Well, that's very clever, Veronica told Marvin. Now, tell us about your day, Rebecca, Veronica said. Well, as you know, Mommy, I'm going to be a real doctor like you, not a mad scientist like somebody I know. Rebecca started and then stuck her tongue out at her brother. Carbon Street is a long tree-lined street with majestic houses on either side. The houses are owned by millionaires who cherish their quiet residential street. Throughout the day, the only noise is usually the sound of various birds singing in the trees or the occasional jetliner flying high overhead. Not even the sound of gas leaf blowers or gas lawn mowers invades the silence. But nothing lasts forever. Carbon Street is about to change. Mr. Bing, a self-made billionaire, has a plan. A big plan. A big plan for a big house. Mr. Bing says he likes to do everything big. I like to make a statement. What's the use of being on this planet if others don't know that you're here? After years of searching all over the world, I have determined that Carbon Street is the perfect place to live. I plan to build the biggest house in the world at the end of this street. Construction will take about three years, but it will be worth it. I'm going to throw at least one party every weekend for all my friends. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a nightmare, said a ne one neighbor. We're already talking to some realtors. Three years of construction, three years of trucks going back and forth every day, and then parties every weekend? We can't even sue him. I think he's got more money than our whole state. No, it's time to move. We went from having the nicest neighborhood to having the worst neighborhood, all because of one new neighbor. I wonder who the idiot is who told him about our street. Sandra had not been to Las Vegas in more than a year. She was excited. Her sister Janice was coming by to pick her up in about ten minutes. Sandra finished putting her toothbrush and toothpaste into her travel bag. Those were the last two items on her to-pack list. She had called ahead, of course, to get a room for Janice and herself. The hotel told her that no more rooms were available at the price that was advertised in the newspaper. This was no surprise to Sandra. So, she put down a $100 non-refundable deposit on a room for two nights. The cost for both nights was going to be $200 plus taxes, surcharges, and other fees. She looked at her watch. Janice was late, of course. Sandra had forgotten to remind Janice of today's departure time. She put it kindly. Janice was not exactly the most organized person in the world. Sandra called Janice up. She left a short message. Where are you? It's time to go to Vegas. A few minutes later, Janice called back. She had a big problem, a schedule conflict. She had already promised to attend her daughter's 8th grade graduation ceremony this very weekend. Oh, Sandra, I'm so sorry, Janice said. I know how much you had wanted to do this. I thought Alice's graduation ceremony and party were next week. I get so confused sometimes. I'll make this up to you. I promise. Maybe you can call up Lily. 
she might be available, even though it's really short notice. If not, don't worry. I'll pay you for everything, and we can make plans again. Sandra sighed and vowed her friend Lily. She wondered how Janice had made it through life so unorganized. A woman golfing with her husband and her mother was taken to the local hospital yesterday afternoon. The woman was struck by a golf cart driven by her mom. Ginger Rogers, 55, was hit by the cart about 2 p.m. at Fairway Golf Course. She was examining her 50-foot putt on the part 5 tenth hole when she heard her mother scream. Ginger turned around just in time to see her mom driving straight towards her. The force of the collision knocked her over, and the cart then ran over her foot. Her mom, 81 years old, said that a squirrel had jumped up into the cart looking for snacks. She tried to shoot the squirrel away. Instead, it rose up on its hind feet and made a hissing sound. Startled and frightened, the old lady hit the gas pedal. The paramedics arrived about 15 minutes later and treated Ginger for a broken left ankle. They gave a mild sedative to her mother, who kept muttering, Vicious, simply vicious. Then they took Ginger to the hospital. Mr. Rogers promised his wife he would visit her after he finished his round.